Hello and welcome to part two of the reinforcement learning theory tutorial series. This time we're going over policies, which are fairly simple actually, but one of the most important part of re or parts of reinforcement learning. There are lots of parts. If you haven't seen the previous video, I definitely recommend checking out. If you're curious just about policies, you're more than welcome to watch just this video though. Uh, as you're watching through, if you like the video, and you drop a like and subscribe, super duper appreciate it. Let's get into it. And I suppose we should start with what are policies? What is a policy? Uh, and why do I have Pac-Man drawn here and a bunch of arrows? Because it is relevant, it's not just clickbait. Even if it was clickbait, it probably wouldn't be that great clickbait. But anyway, <laughs> let's go ahead and delete this and get ourselves some working room. So the reason I have all this drawn out is because policies are about states and specifically uh, well, not entirely, but mostly about actions. That's really what they're about. They're about actions. And in Pac-Man, what are your actions? Well, you can go up, down, left, or right. In this case, you can't really even go up or down. You can just go left or continue to go right. But specifically, policies are about figuring out what actions to take. Specifically, they actually map states to actions. Um, so you could imagine in this case, right, it looks like we want to probably go right. That's probably a good idea. We've already taken all the uh, dots behind us, uh, probably don't want anything ahead of us. Uh, however, like, you know, what if there's a, uh, oh, that's not the right color. What if there's a ghost? Ghosty wosty. <laughs> that's not a good ghost. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> not the best ghost, but the eyes actually worked out quite nice there. Uh, so if we got a ghost, um, going right is probably not our best action and an optimal policy, a policy, <laughs> sorry, this is so bad. A policy that does the best thing is probably going to go left and get away from this ghost, right? So that's that's kind of how you imagine an AI could work, right? We have some policy and we're learning what a good action is or what a good mapping from states to actions are. So what about the formalities of policies? How do we write it out? What does it look like in papers? Um, so policies can be noted, be denoted usually by either mu or by pi. Uh, there, there are specifically differences between when these are usually used. Uh, mu is typically used for uh, deterministic, deterministic policies, while as pi tends to be used for stochastic, uh, stick <laughs> policies. Um, most of the time, um, not all the time, uh, just maybe it's because of the types of papers I read, but I see pi a lot more of the time uh, because papers that I read tend to use a lot more stochastic policies. Uh, that being said, they are both used. Uh, I'm probably just gonna use pi throughout the rest of the tutorials unless I specifically wanna talk about deterministic policies uh, because it's uh, just what I'm more accustomed to. Uh, let's actually delete this all. Um, so there's a couple more things that we want to go over. So right. Uh, pi is is the function. Now we actually take in a parameter of pi, right? Specifically, as I mentioned, we take in the state. So pi is actually, or the policy is actually a, a function, right? It takes in some input, the state, and it will output some action. Uh, though specifically when we're dealing with these sto stochastic policies, um, and just in case you, quick reminder on what stochastic means, uh, it means essentially it's not entirely predetermined. You know, there's a, there's a distribution of what can happen, or there's probabilities involved. Um, and because there's probabilities involved, instead of mapping to a specific action, usually we will instead do this, uh, a squiggly line uh, policy. And maybe I can write that a, a little bit bigger. Uh, and essentially what this means is we are sampling an action from the policy, right? Because, you know, out of up, down, left, or right, in this case, you know, maybe there's a chance we want to go up. Hopefully it would be like this, right? We see 0% chance we want to go up, 0% chance we want to go down, 100% chance we want to go left, 0% chance we want to go right. This is what I would hope, um, and I'm doing it in this order that's listed right here, up, left, down, uh, sorry, up, down, left, right, up, down, left, right, <laughs> uh, left, right. I'm making myself crack up with how bad my drawings are. This looks like a pinch fork. Um, an upside down one. Uh, anyway, you could imagine this would probably be the best policy here. Um, you know, however, if the ghost wasn't here, you could imagine maybe, maybe we're not entirely decided which way we want to go. You know, maybe up, 
probably still zero and down is probably still zero because they don't do anything. Uh, but maybe left is uh, 0 0.1 and right is 0 0.9 because maybe there's like some fruit behind this we missed or something if we go back left. I don't know. Um, not to mention these usually aren't entirely, you know, especially when you're dealing with neural networks as we will be later, uh, these are usually more like 0 0.001 or 0 0.12 and then 0 0.8 and then so on, right? They're not so clean. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of what these look like, right? Uh, you're dealing with a distribution uh, over the action space of what actions you might want to take. And as I just mentioned, actually, I hinted to the next point. Uh, in these tutorials, I'm talking about the general theory, but in practice, lots of the times what we'll use, especially you know, in deep reinforcement learning, is we're using neural networks to parameterize these um, policies, right? Uh, that's how we're essentially training our AI. We're, we're not training like a bunch of different things. I mean, sometimes we are, but usually we're specifically training the weights of the policy. And to denote that, usually uh, you'll denote the weights by using some variable. Um, what you'll see probably most op often is theta. Uh, sometimes you also see, I'm not sure if this is phi or phi. I should probably look that up, phi or phi. But uh, usually uh, I, I see theta. Um, and this essentially just denotes this policy. The output we get here is based on this like neural network weights or uh, maybe you're not using a neural network. There's other things you can use here. But that's essentially what you'll see a lot, right? So this essentially means just quick overview, action sampled from our policy that's based on a neural network getting an input from a state. Cool, not too bad, right? There is one more thing I wanna mention because in this current example, we're only dealing with a discrete action space. Um, and in this discrete action space, what that means is we have a finite sort of uh, amount of very specific actions, up, down, left, right. What if we're dealing with an environment where we have a continuous action space, right? Um, and an example of a continuous action space might be, uh, Oh gosh, I'm not sure. Maybe we have like a game we're playing and we need to decide the strength of how hard we want to punch something, right? <laughs> I'm, you can see, I'm, you can very much tell I'm coming up with this off the top of my head, right? If we need to come up with uh, how hard we want to punch something, uh, that's not going to be left, right, up, or down. That's going to be more like, uh, you know, maybe 0 0.2 or <laughs> 86 uh, or 5. You could see, you know, um, it can be anything, right? It can be anything in between these. Maybe there's still a limit, uh, but it could also be 0 0.200001. Uh, that, that's what I mean by continuous action space. So maybe everything between zero and one is what you'll see very frequently. So how do we deal with this, right? Um, in neural networks, uh, the discrete option is pretty easy. You output maybe once you get these, what you do is you use a categorical distribution and we, we just sample these based on we, we turn these into percentages right so in this case i would have a 10 percent chance of taking this action and a 90 percent chance of taking this action uh, but it's always categorical right uh, in the end if we choose this one this would be action like two this would be action three and we only have four different choices so continuous how would we output this there's multiple ways to do it one way we can do that is through a sort of outputting the parameters of a Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian distribution. Uh, ga I'm going to make this bigger. Gaussian distribution. So what is a Gaussian distribution? Uh, you've probably seen graphs of this. If you've ever taken a stats course, you probably know. Uh, if we have a graph, right, a Gaussian distribution looks something like Ooh. <laughs> this, uh, except for it's supposed to be perfectly symmetrical. Uh, imagine, you know, help, help me out a little bit here. Um, it's perfectly symmetrical. It has a center, a varying amount of spread, and it continues on the left and right going out forever, although it continually diminishes as the farther you go out. Gaussian distributions, also commonly called normal distributions, are seen a lot of places uh, in, in sort of nature or just in common society. Uh, lots, they're used for lots of modeling problems. Uh, sort of cutting to the chase though, the reason Gaussian distributions or one of the reasons we use them that's really nice, um, there's lots of mathematical reasons, but one reason that kind of makes it simple is that you can express them with only two parameters. 
Um, this is not the primary reason we use them, but just, just one. Um, and that is the mean, which is denoted with mu, and the standard deviation, uh, which is, or I guess, maybe it's not called the standard deviation in Gaussian distributions, or mm, I don't really know, uh, or the variation. Anyway, it's, it's denoted with the sigma character. And essentially with these two, we can make any Gaussian distribution. So mu controls the mean. So in the mean is where this is located, right? This one is centered at zero, zero, or specifically it's centered at zero on the x-axis. Um, but if our mu was five, well, it would be more over here, right? If this was five. Our sigma, essentially, this is the standard deviation. Uh, and it has to do with the spread. Uh, so if, if maybe this is a sigma of one, and if this right here is a sigma of one, well, a sigma of 10 might look something like this, a lot more spread out, right? Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, this matters because we can output a mean. So let's say we have an action space, right, where we just need to output one specific uh, continuous uh, action action right and it can be between zero and one well what we can do then oh didn't mean to do that uh how do i cancel that i have no clue ah there we go get rid of you um so one way we can do that is let me let me get us some space again i haven't been using this so get rid of you get rid of you so let's say we just need one output right uh well how are we going to do that and it can be between say Zero, let's say zero and 10. It can be between zero and 10. Um, well, we could output anything between here, but let's say maybe we want to output like six. Uh, so our mu can be six if we want to on average output six. Um, and then, but we, we kind of want to also have a little bit of spread. So let's say our, but not too much spread. So let's say maybe our sigma would end up being uh, one. Well, what we can essentially do then is we can plug these into the Gaussian formula, which I, I'm, to save myself, I'm not going to write out here, uh, but that would essentially allow us to, we can then sample a number from this, right? So if it's something like this, well, we'd probably get maybe like 6.2 or we get like 6, uh, sorry, uh, 6.1002 or 5.1 or maybe we even get three, probably not going to happen, right? Because this is very far from the from the mu and our sigma isn't very high. Uh, probably not gonna happen, but it might. Uh, maybe we get 4.5. Essentially what, what you can see, right, is it allows us to sample variables around, or sample values around a specific target. Um, and that's kind of how this Gaussian distribution works when, when we're going to output a continuous action. This is, again, just one way of doing it. There's other ways to, uh, to do it. Uh, I, I don't have any great examples of this. Maybe I should have prepared one. Oops, I'll, I'll make sure next to next, or next, to next time. Um, but that's sort of the two different types of policies we can have. We can have continuous and discrete. And I guess also there's the other dichotomy of having a, uh, what is it, a stochastic versus a deterministic. Anyway. That is that, that sort of wraps it up for policies, I guess just quickly going over uh, what we went through. Policies map states to actions, right? States to actions. They're usually parameterized by some sort of variable or set of variables. Uh, usually in our cases in the future, that will be neural networks. Um, and these types of stochast stochastic uh, policies are, uh, they are denoted with Hi, I'm talking so much, I'm starting to lose sense of myself. Uh, <laughs> and when we do sample an action, it looks like this in formal code. And this is sort of the end goal, right? We want to learn an optimal policy and that's why policies are so important. If we learn an optimal policy, a policy that gets the best reward in every scenario, well, then we can say we have successfully solved an environment. That is all for policies that wraps it up. If you enjoyed the video, definitely hit the like button, subscribe. I really appreciate it. But that's all. Thank you for watching. And I hope to catch you next time when we go over rewards and returns.